This is the Linguistics Podcast. Questions or comments can be directed to Twitter at Linguist Chris or on WordPress, http colon slash slash linguistchris.wordpress.com. Hello and welcome to the Linguistics Podcast. My name is Chris, and in this episode we're going to be discussing morphology. Now morphology essentially is the study of form and meaning, or specifically forms which are assigned a certain meaning in a given language. Um, this is the first time we've included meaning in our study of language. The previous episodes have talked about phones, phonemes, and allophones. Um, that would be episode two and three. Uh, and this episode, we're finally bringing meaning into the mix. And we'll see why it, it adds uh, an extra dimension and an important dimension uh, to the study of language. So first, let's talk about the concept of morpheme. What is a morpheme? It turns out that a morpheme is the smallest unit of language which can be assigned a meaning. If you want to be a little bit more general, you can say the smallest unit of form which can be assigned a meaning. So what is meant by that? Well, let's think about the word notebook. Notebook, okay? Now, notebook is made of two parts, note and book. Okay, we know that we can split notebook into two parts, and that each one of those parts still has a unique meaning. So the word notebook as a whole has a unique meaning, the word note has a meaning, and the word book has meaning. But can you break up the word note into meaningful parts? So we could certainly break it up into no and t, right? Um, and we could say, well, no has a meaning. Well, yes, it's true. But the meaning of no is not used to build up the meaning of note. And that's an important distinction. Uh, the word no cannot be used in conjunction with something else to make the meaning note. Right? The meaning of no is too different from the meaning of note. Um, what we are trying to do when we break down words like notebook is break them into smaller units which can be used to compose the whole in terms of its meaning. So notebook, the concept note and the concept book both have something to do with the concept notebook. And therefore we would say that notebook is composed of two morphemes. Okay. Now, morphemes can be further classified, and one, one thing we'll speak about is free and bound morphemes. Okay. So what is a free morpheme? Well, a free morpheme is one which can stand alone in entirely the same way um, as it stands in the other word, or the larger word, or the compound, if you will. So notebook, both of those morphemes, note and book, would be free, because they can both stand on their own. Um, if we look at a different word, um, let's say carelessness. Okay, now let's let's examine this first as two morphemes. Okay, so we'll have careless and ness. Now, careless certainly could stand alone. If we pulled careless out of carelessness, we could say it's a furry morpheme of a sort. All right. Uh, what about ness? Well, ness can't stand alone. We all know what ness means. We all know what it does, uh, but it can't stand on its own. Uh, you can't say, uh, hey, what's, you know, what's on the nest today? What about that nest over there? You, you can't use it in any sort of independent context. Uh, and for that reason, nest is a bound morpheme. All right. Uh, it is, it only appears when it's bound to another morpheme of some kind. All right. Now, that's not to say it doesn't have a meaning. To be a morpheme, it has to have a meaning. But we'll discuss the nature of that meaning in a little bit. Now, uh, we sort of cheated there by saying careless was only one morpheme. Now, is it a morpheme? Well, it's a morph. It's a certain form. But in fact, it's composed of two morphemes if we try and break it down to the smallest units of form and meaning. We would have care and less. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Okay, Care certainly is a free morpheme. Care can occur on its own in independent context. What about less? We know that less is a word. But does it have the exact same meaning of less and careless? Most linguists would argue no, and it would be accepted that less and careless is actually a bound morpheme. A bound morpheme. Why? Because the only way it shows up uh, in the way that it is listed in careless uh, is after another morph. So if you say less, as in uh, I have less of something, uh, it's a similar meaning, but it's not the same meaning, because to be careless is to be without a care. You're not comparing that care to something else, as you would be if you use less independently. So we would say, again, that the less in careless is a bound morpheme. 
So a word like carelessness is then made up of three morphemes. One, uh, one free morpheme, care, and two bound morphemes, less and ness. All right? So, um, if we want to further classify morphemes, we can call them lexical or functional morphemes. Now, this is where ness is going to come into play. Ness uh, is a lexical morpheme. And what do we mean by lexical morphemes? Well, a lexical morpheme uh, has several properties, but one, and, and probably the one that makes it easiest to remember, is if a morpheme changes a part of speech of a word, then it is a lexical morpheme. So let's go back to carelessness. Careless is an adjective, of course, a describing word, if you want to remember in that way. Uh, and ness, if you add that ness, you turn it into a noun. So there's a process uh, by which the addition of this lexical morpheme changes the part of speech of the root from an adjective to a noun. And ness is productive in that fashion. We, we say it's productive because any adjective that you add ness to would be understood as a noun, even if they're not in the dictionary. Okay, um, so if if something if a morpheme does that, if a morpheme is productive in that way, automatically it's a lexical morpheme. Okay, now likewise, in order to be a functional morpheme, uh, the word has to only serve a function in a sentence. Now, generally, functional morphemes in English, in fact, all of them, I believe, uh, will be uh, free morphemes. And these are words, sentence functional words, so things like for, um, not, things like this. These are all words which are uh, functional morphemes and not lexical morphemes. Lexical morphemes have a more diverse set of meanings, and they're productive uh, in that they will change parts of speech of roots that they attach to. All right? Okay. Um, so that's a quick crash course in morphology and the sort of things that it deals with. Um, there's also a, a very close similarity in morphology to something we talked about in the phonology episode, uh, and that is uh, phones and allophones. We also have morphs and allomorphs, or morphemes and allomorphs, okay? Um, so what is an allomorph of a morpheme? Well, this is where we're going to go back to those English plurals that we were talking about in the previous episode, all right? So we remember that we had a phonologically motivated uh, well, what it really is is phonologically motivated allomorphy, okay? Um, of course, I didn't use that term in the last episode because it hadn't been introduced yet, um, but that's what it is. So we have uh, things like pots, pans, and buses, okay? Pots, pans, buses. So we have pots with a s, pans with a z, and buses with a is, all right? Now, we would say that s, z, and is are allomorphs of the same morpheme. Now, what is that morpheme? Well, that particular morpheme is a bound morpheme, which represents plural. It denotes that something is in the plural number, um, specifically a noun. Which plural you use, which allomorph is realized, is phonologically motivated. All right? So notice that we wouldn't want to say that they're allophones, because each is made, well, not each, but the third one is made up of more than one phone and retains the meaning plural. And likewise, the first two have a meaning. They're not simply phones, right? So remember that if you're dealing with meaning, then you want to look at morphology. If you're not dealing with meaning, that's what phonology was for, okay? Um, so we have three allomorphs of one morpheme. The morpheme is plural, and it can be realized in a number of different ways based on the phonology of the root. Okay, so these things interconnect, as you can see. Um, and not only English plurals do that, but English past tense will do that. Um, so if you have something like stopped versus uh, owned. So I owned that car, the past tense is a d, owned. But if I say I stopped that car, the past tense is a t, stopped. Again, phonologically motivated, stop ends in a voiceless consonant, own ends in a voiced consonant, and so you get one or the other based on the environment. But we still want to say that there's one morpheme for past tense in English. It's simply realized as one of its allomorphs, uh, depending on the phonological environment where it's placed. All right. Okay. Uh, 
so with that, that that's as, as brief I can give you morphology, but I do want to cover a couple more things about uh, word formation. Uh, so whenever we have something that attaches to something else in, in terms of words, we call that affixation. Okay, You affix something to something else. And affixes can come in various types, and this is what I want to go over very briefly. Uh, affixes can be prefixes. Everybody certainly knows what a prefix is. A prefix is an affix that comes before the root. And they can be suffixes. Okay, a suffix is an affix which comes after the root. Now, if you think about English uh, verbal morphology, in other words, what we mark on our verbs in English, uh, English very famously uh, only has suffixation in terms of verbal inflection. Okay, uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that if we want to mark something in past tense, we add a suffix. If we want to mark something for third person, we add a suffix. Now, granted, we don't do a lot of marking, but other languages can do uh, can do this, these same processes using other things. Uh, for example, some languages might mark it by a prefix. Okay, uh, English simply uses suffixation. Okay, um, there's two other very common uh, uh, processes cross linguistically that I think are worth mentioning, and this is infixation and interfixation. Uh, infixation. Uh, actually, let me cover interfixation first. Interfixation is what happens when you have a root and the interfix is placed inside that root in such a way that it's not a complete chunk. Okay? Um, so, for example, uh, some uh, uh, languages like Arabic have what's, what are called consonantal roots. Uh, so you have a root like k, t, b, right? Uh, which I believe uh, means uh, something like uh, something to do with books. Uh, and then you have uh, a, an, an interfix which goes in between those consonants, a vocalic interfix, so a set of two vowels, really, that fit in between those consonants and are interfixed into them uh, to make a word. So kitab is uh, a word meaning book in Arabic. And uh, let me just make up a, a nonce example, uh, something like kutub would probably be some other word having to do with books, uh, but not meaning book. All right. Um, so that's very interesting because you have ia in the first one to make kitab, uh, but that ia is considered one morpheme because they go as a set into the word. Okay, that's called an interfix. Now you can contrast that with an infix. All right. An infix is where a complete unit goes inside another word, and this can be used. Uh, in verbal inflection in some languages. Uh, in English, we actually use it in sort of a slangy way, especially in British English. Um, we have a word in English, fantastic, uh, but in British English, uh, it's not uncommon to hear fan-bloody-tastic. Fan-bloody-tastic. Uh, that bloody is being used as an infix. It's being put into fantastic. Um, in American English, we'll do a lot with friggin, uh, so Califrigginfornia. Uh, sounds fine, and it's because we have a fairly productive system of infixation uh, in in both uh, major varieties of English, which allow us to put this sort of expletive inside other words, provided they they match the syllable structure properly, uh, and that's called infixation. Uh, and those are also morphological issues, and that's why I wanted to mention them very briefly. Um, I don't know of any good single source. If you're interested in morphology, I don't know of any good single source to learn. From it, certainly there's there's textbooks on the on the topic, uh, although I haven't seen one that's that's very good. Morphology, I think, is one of those things that you have to study linguistics for a while to learn or to really get down pat. I can give you a crash course on it right here, and you can sort of learn some of the terms behind it. But to really see how morphology works, you have to learn not only uh, some other aspects of linguistics, but you have to sort of let it soak in for a little while. So if you're confused about morphology right now, just give it a little time. Uh, the next episode will cover syntax, and that's how words go together, and that tends to help people understand what's happening in morphology, because once again, the same processes which build words end up building sentences and so on. So you have some mirroring going on from one subfield to the other. Um, so, like I said, the next episode we'll talk about syntax. Um, that, again, is a very big subfield, uh, so I will try and be as brief as possible, uh, but still be cohesive. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, I encourage you to please uh, contact me, uh, preferably via Twitter, uh, at Linguist Chris. And I've also got a blog, uh, which you can go, and there's, there's some contact information up there. 
And that's at http colon slash slash linguistchris.wordpress.com. Thanks again.